the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again. So he says peace to them two times. He says peace to you. The first time he says peace be with you. The second time he says peace to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You may be seated in the Lord, the house of the Lord. All right, let, let me set this up. So eight days after the resurrection of Jesus, his disciples, or more importantly, those that he has commissioned to be apostles, which would be the 12 minus 1, because Judas has defected and he hung himself. And so now there are 10 in the room. Sunday before last, we told you that Thomas was not in the room at that particular time. So after his resurrection, Jesus shows up. And when he walks in, the Bible says, he says to them, peace be with you. Then he shows them his wounds. And they were glad to see him. And then the text says, he says to them, peace to you. It's interesting that he makes an announcement of peace, shows them his wounds, and makes another announcement of peace. We've been dealing with wounds and, 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 and what wounds really mean in, in terms of your growth and your development into who God has created you to be. This whole series, and I don't have time to go, to go over all the things that we've talked about, but this whole series has really been about you uh, coming into the you that God has created you to be. You know, we talked about this whole thing of whole thing of getting back to the basics and how Jesus is Savior, yes. Lord, yes. Master, yes. But he is also the prototype uh, of what all of God's children should be. That he is the second Adam, and in being the second Adam, it means that whatever the first Adam was, Jesus himself was, and whatever Jesus himself was, we ought to be. Which is human beings, human beings, physical beings, with the spirit of God living on the inside of us. Y'all follow me, I'm not going to be long. That's... That's what we all should be. Not only should we be that, but we all already are that. We just don't realize it. So what Jesus comes to do is he comes to show us that the word, the word, the thoughts, the logos, the logic of God can be made flesh or can be made human. And that the spirit of God can exist in carnal man. That people who have flaws and faults and all that kind of stuff. The spirit of God still lives in you. That's what Jesus came. The word was made flesh and moved among us. So when Jesus is moving among us, watch this. He's moving among us as us. With all of the with all of the weaknesses, the human weaknesses. All right? So so Jesus could be hurt. Not just physically, but emotionally. 
like you could. Jesus had these thoughts like you have. Hello? For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities or our weaknesses, but he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. And y'all have heard me say this, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. You can't tempt anybody that does not have the ability to sin. So Jesus is walking around in human flesh dealing with what you deal with. Now, it doesn't get worse until after his baptism. Watch this, Amber. When he comes up out of the water, heaven opens, the spirit descends him, descends upon him like a dove, and God says, you're my son. So it is, it is after the Holy Spirit comes up on him, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, that immediately he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's tempted by the devil. Now, remember, you can't be tempted unless there's something in you for temptation to appeal to. I was wondering today, I was just riding, in the, <laughs> I was just riding Troy, and I was just thinking, it was, I was actually at home when it started thinking, I got in the car and it kept processing. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, and we're going to go there in a minute, we're going to go to Matthew 6 in a minute. He teaches his disciples to pray, and he says to them, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. Watch this. And lead us not into temptation. Stop. Why is he telling them to pray that they would not be led into temptation? When the spirit of God led him into temptation. Because Jesus understands something that he wants us to understand. That there is a temptation that is so strong. That if the grace of God is not with you and the hand of God is not on you and the spirit of God is not freely operating in you, you will lose your you. <laughs> Listen, not only will you lose the fight, but you'll lose your mind. So I'm just trying to figure out why are you trying to, why are you telling me to ask God or the spirit of God not to lead me into something that he's going to lead me into anyway? All right. So so here it is. Jesus comes, he says, peace, shows them the wounds. I guess, you know, couldn't have been me. Couldn't have been me if I was Jesus, because I'd have been Michael Jackson it out, you know. I would have. Y'all know he had to pull up his robe to. <laughs> Put me in your next dance thing. Peace shows them the wounds, says peace again. Peace be with you. Look at my wounds. Peace be unto you. I'm giving you a peace. Watch this. I had to speak peace to you first because I'm going to show you something that's going to disturb your peace. <laughs> and after I show you what's going to disturb your peace, I got to speak peace to you again. Because I got to show you, watch this, that the way I was wounded, you will be too. That's why he says it. How do I know? Because the next, in, 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 in the next words he said, that's right. Uh, that's right. He got the spirit. <laughs> that's what Pentecost is about. And the spirit be poured out. Your, your, your young children, will, they ain't what he said? 
Let that boy catch the Holy Ghost. Don't, don't, don't shut him up. Go get a fan and fan him or something, but don't take him out. <laughs> you all right, mother? He shows him, and, and, and here is how I know, because the next, the next words he says are very key. Now, again, I'm just teaching. I'm imparting, but y'all got to follow this. He says, as the Father sent me, so am I sending you. Now, the word sent is the Greek word apostolos. Apostolos, from which we get the word apostle. And an apostle is a sent one. And when he says, as the Father sent me, so am I sending you, he's not just saying the same path. But he's also saying the same process. So the thing that got me these wounds, you will encounter, and it will wound you as well. And if you don't have a piece about the process, if you don't have a piece about the process, you'll lose it. So he's doing two things, Miss Willie Mae. The first thing he's doing, he's showing up because they're, they're behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. They're fearing, watch this, that the same thing that the Jews did to Jesus, they're going to do to him. The same thing that Jesus' enemies did to him, they say they're going to do to us because we're associated with him. So he has to show them the wounds to say, I went through it and I made it. I came back from it. Secondly, he's trying to say there is no way you can go through life without being wounded in the way I wish I in the way that I was wounded. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And how you deal with the wounds is up to you. I'll bring you back. I wish I had a witness. You will survive the process, but your attitude after it's over is what determines whether or not you get stuck or go further. You cannot avoid being wounded. I ask, I ask, I ask, I ask young preachers all the time, and 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 and, and I asked, I asked, I asked my son. I, I said, I said, how badly do you want the anointing that's necessary? For you to be effective in ministry. And I left it added as an open end question. And the answer is this. If you want that kind of anointing. You have to experience this kind of wounding. So I love it. He showed, I'm almost done. He says peace. Look at my wounds. Peace. Because the same thing that I went through, you may not be nailed to a cross, even though one of them was. Peter was nailed upside down. Hello? Andrew was cut in half. Oh, Lord have mercy. Uh, John was thrown in a pot of hot oil and boiled but didn't die. Thomas was killed with a spear. All the other, all the other apostles died violent deaths. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. So, so, so here's the whole issue: you trying to figure out why you're going through what you're going through, and it's like nothing you've ever been through before. Because it is literally, watch this, to bring the best out of you. Oh, God have mercy. Or something that will help and assist and aid you in becoming who God has created you to be. Now, it's going to seem like y'all losing this, but I feel it. I'm so free today. man. I I feel the freedom, yet I feel your pain. Because some of you are dealing with situations that you've never dealt with before. Some of you are like Job. The thing that I fear the most has happened to me. Because you got your list of stuff that you can handle. But you got at least one thing that you don't want to happen. 
Because if it happened, you don't know how you're going to make it. And it happened, and you're still dealing with it. And you're feeling all of the pain, and you're feeling all of the discomfort, and you're feeling all of the distress, and you're praying, but nothing seems to be lifted, and you're fasting, and you're calling out to God, and nothing seems to be changing. I wish I had a witness. And you ain't whisked off to a better situation and better service. Hey, do y'all understand that after Jesus was resurrected, he still, he still had to stay in the earth for 40 days. He can go. He can automatically go back to the Father. He had to stay. He had to stay in the environment of the reminders of everything that happened to him. So watch this, and I'm I'm, I'm not going. Man, boy, I feel good. You gonna shout in a minute? Somebody gonna get free in a minute? So shows them the wounds. No, it says peace. Shows them the wounds, says peace again. You're going to go through this stuff too. Maybe not to the same degree, but remember, I'm trying to make you more like me. All right? So you got to go through. In order to get to where I am, you got to go through with what I go with what I went through. Then he breathes on them, and this is what I want to talk about. He breathes, it said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Then he says something else that's real interesting. I'm going to go ahead and jump to it uh, and, and, and get to my stuff, and then we're going home. Then he says this. Who's ever sinned, you forgive. They'll be forgiven. And who's ever sinned, you retain. They will be retained. So I'm trying to figure out why the first thing he said, Lord have mercy, after he breathed on them or released the Holy Spirit to them was watch this. Deal with the issue of forgiveness. There's something called the law of first mentions. I might not even get to my notes. I, this, is so, this is so deep in me, bees. I may not even get to my notes next week. Uh, there's something called the law of first mention, which means that whatever is said first is most important. And see, a lot of folk want the Holy Ghost to do what he talks about in Mark 16. You know, in my name you shall cast out devils. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. You shall speak with new tongues. Lot. But Jesus says in his first discourse, post his resurrection, in his first discourse on the Holy Spirit, he says, "Um, I'm giving you this gift to enable you to forgive who wounded you. Check the record. Jesus teaches predominantly on three subjects. Check it. One of the subjects is faith. The second of the subjects is love. And the third of the subjects is forgiveness. Jesus says more about love, faith, and forgiveness than he says about anything else. There's a reason that Jesus tells the ten... That I'm giving you this gift. (sighs) So that you can have the ability to forgive. Because if you can't forgive, your faith will not work. If you can't forgive, you cannot walk in the God kind of love. So we got to settle the forgiveness issue first. And Jesus says, it's something that I must admit that you can't do on your own. Because there is a deep level of wounding that does take place that you in and of yourself cannot forgive. Help me to teach you, Jesus, I will. Jesus is hanging on the cross, right? 
And that we say he says seven last words. Well, the first of his last words are these. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Don't miss this. He makes a clear distinction between Jesus, the man, and Jesus, God. Y'all miss this. He does not hang on the cross and say, hey, I forgive y'all. He says, this thing is too heavy for me, so I need to make a delineation, and I need to let people see me crying out to a God, I wish I, to the Spirit of God, watch this, that will enable me to forgive such injury. He calls on God who is spirit. And he says, Father, in my flesh. And I done done a whole lot of stuff in my flesh. Lord, your spirit was in me and I was walking on water. Your spirit was in me, I changed water into wine. God have mercy. Your spirit was in me and I stepped up to my friend Lazarus' grave and, and he had been dead for four days uh, but I told him to roll the stone away and I called him back. I, that was a woman that, that had an issue of blood for 12 long years. I didn't even know she existed. But she touched the hem of my garment and she was made well. There's another woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. God, all, all, all of that was my anointing that was in my flesh. God have mercy. But there is an anointing, a next level of anointing, a next level of empowerment that's going to be needed. Watch this. To forgive those who have wounded me. So he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Then he says, deal with the issue of forgiveness. Because if you don't get this right, you'll never get the fullness of what I have for you. <laughs> if you don't get this right, everything that I see, you can see what God has promised you, but never receive it. Can I see this for a minute, please? Mm -hmm. You can read this every day of your life. See it, understand the words, know that these are the promises of God. You can hear the preacher preach it, teach it. You can see people walking in it. Know that it's true. But it never, ever manifests in your life. And it will not manifest if unforgiveness is in your heart. You might want to write this down. God allows you to be wounded so deeply to increase your capacity to forgive. That's the only reason you go through deep wounding. So that your capacity to forgive can increase. Right. See, Because if you can't forgive, you can't get what God has for you. Are y'all following me? So in Matthew chapter 16, you don't have to turn there. I already quoted it. I I tell you, I'm just dropping nuggets. Y'all got to catch what's for you. And today, I'm not being arrogant, but all this is for you. But you need to just write down what you can write down and then, you know, get the tape and go through it or CD and go through it some more. So in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus teaches his disciples, chapter 6, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, he's teaching his disciples to pray. Check this out. It's really interesting. Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking to them about a whole lot of stuff. Then he tells them to pray. He's teaching them on prayer, and he says, and when you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Then he comes back, and he gives an addendum. He says, I want to add this. 
For if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Now, I want, I want to teach, I, I taught y'all something a while ago, those of you who were here uh, with us about three or four years ago, that when Jesus teaches them to pray, what we call the Lord's Prayer, we just call it the Lord's Prayer. Jesus didn't make it up. It is a traditional prayer called the Avinu Prayer. Avinu in Aramaic means father. All right. So it, it is it is what Hebrews or Jews pray to God. During especially during, uh, you know, the, the, the feast, uh, certain feasts and festivals, they pray that prayer. So Jesus didn't make that prayer up. All right. But what he does is when he finishes outlining the prayer, he puts a wrinkle in it and he tells his disciples, he say, hey, let's go back to this issue of forgiveness. Because what you said in the prayer, what this prayer has been saying all the time is uh, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus says, I want to focus on that a little more. He said, so I need y'all to understand, this ain't in the prayer, Jesus says, but I want y'all to focus on this. If you don't forgive others, God cannot forgive you. I'm working my way somewhere. So he says, in order to increase your capacity to forgive, I have to allow you to be wounded. And he says, watch this. The only way, the only reason I'm allowing you to be wounded is that I might be able to pull something out of you, God have mercy, that is strong enough and great enough to help you to deal with life as it comes. Are y'all following? Now it's going to seem like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to seem like I'm all over the place and maybe I am, but somebody's going to catch this. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter number No, turn to John chapter number 16 first. John 16. Oh, God. The one thing that's been holding you up is you have forgiven in your flesh, but you have not forgiven out of your spirit. You have said the word, I forgive you, but you're not walking in the reality of forgiveness. And you mean well. You mean well, but you continue to hold a grudge. Watch this. No, you're not holding the grudge. The grudge is holding you. The grudge is stronger than you are. Do you know what the, what the real definition of a demon is? A demon ain't just a little, you know, ain't a little thing that's ugly and got wings and The word demon really means something that is stronger than your goodwill. Y'all miss this. That's what demonic means. It means something that is stronger than your goodwill. So like you want to forgive. And you said that you have forgiven. You told me you forgave me. They told you they forgave you. We told each other that we forgave each other. Yet, watch this, the unforgiveness is stronger than your goodwill. So you really want to release them. God have mercy. But your mind still stays focused on what they did to you. And what they did to you shapes your attitude. And your attitude determines how you deal with them. And your struggle is, but I thought I forgave. I thought I forgave my daddy for abandoning me. (laughs) I thought I forgave my friend for doing what they did to me. It's That which is stronger than your goodwill. Paul talks about it. When I would do good. Translation. I want to do good, but this demon won't let me. (laughs) 
I want to forgive him, but every time I see how he just left me with these babies. Now I'm really hot because the youngest of the babies is 21. And now he ain't got to pay no more child support. I wish I had a witness in here. And now, if I don't help pay off these student loans that I signed for, I'm going to be in the work. Am I talking to anybody in here who? That's what Paul says. I want, listen, for the context of, of this discussion, I really want to forgive, but this demon got me. I heard two wows. Give me one more and I'll go on. <laughs> am I where you are? Am, am, am I talking to anybody who like really knows that it's necessary to forgive, to get whatever you need from God? You've been in church long enough. You know that unforgiveness is the issue. You understand that. You're anointed. You got gifts. You got all this stuff. And you really hate the fact that you can't let it go. Because that's what forgiveness means, to let it go. You hate the fact that you can't let it go, but you can't let it go. What time is the sun? All right, give me, give me, give me about 10 minutes, and I'm going to try to be done. So y'all got John 16? Now I'm going to go to Genesis 2 after this, but I want to show you something. So, 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 so check this out. From John 13... To John 16, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. In John 13, here's what we find out. That, that Satan has entered Judas, has put it in Judas's heart to betray Jesus. All right? In John 14, Jesus starts talking about the Holy Spirit. He starts talking about this whole thing, that the Holy Spirit is going to come and all this stuff. John, John chapter 15, he says, now stay connected to me because, you know, I, I'm the vine, y'all the branches. And if you're going to produce, you got to stay connected to me. And then he tells him this, and I love this in John 15. He says, now, here is the proof that you're connected. That you got to love one another as I've loved you. That's the way I want y'all to love one another. Now, Judas is still sitting at the table. I'm setting y'all up for about two weeks from now. So Jesus is sitting at the table. Judas is sitting at the table with them. And Jesus is telling all 12, watch this. He's telling them, he's saying, y'all, listen. Uh, y'all got to love one another. Everybody at this table included. The way I've loved y'all, y'all got to love one another. Are y'all following me? John 16, he starts talking about, he continues his discourse on the Holy Spirit, and he says something real interesting about the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm, I'm going to get out of here. John chapter 16. Um, look at verse number 5. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me where are you going, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So y'all, so y'all sad because I'm getting ready to leave. Y'all, y'all have no idea what's getting ready to happen. Y'all, y'all have just accepted the fact that I'm about to leave. Y'all don't have any idea that Judas is gonna betray me. But you also don't have any idea, Peter, that you're going to deny me. And the other ten, you don't have any idea that y'all are going to abandon me. Let me put a pin right here. The reason you need to be able to develop in forgiveness is for those three reasons. Betrayal, denial, and abandonment. Repeat them after me. Betrayal, Betrayal. denial, and abandonment. Okay, let me break these three down. Here's what betrayal is. Betrayal is a breaking of trust. 
If someone breaks your trust, it wounds you. Denial. Here's what denial is. Denial is a refusal to stand with someone. Watch this. Based upon the degree of difficulty of their process. So here's what Peter does. Remember they sitting at the table and he says, listen, not only is somebody going to betray me, but all y'all going to leave me. <laughs> and Peter says, Lord, these other fellows might, but I ain't going nowhere. And he says, Peter, before the cock crows three times or two times, you, you're going to deny me three times. So Jesus is standing before the high priest. And Peter is warming himself by fire of the servants of the enemies of Jesus. And they see Peter and they say, you one of them. He said, no, I ain't. <laughs> he says, yes, you are. Peter said, man, listen. <laughs> Not me. Third time somebody else says, yes, you are. And then Peter said, God, I mean, doggone it. <laughs> the Bible says he cursed. I swear it ain't me. Then after he says that, this little girl said, yeah, you even talk like it. <laughs> you can't even cuss right. delivered and then cussed and you can't even cuss right now all of y'all can't answer that because your cuss game is still in, right? but for those of you who don't have a strong cuss for those of you who've been delivered for real you know what I'm saying deliver it more you know those, <laughs> you be putting words where they don't belong you, you be telling people to go to places that don't even exist My grandma, who was the purest soul ever. Bees, you remember mother. Uh, uh, no, do you remember mother? Yeah, yeah. My, my, grand, my, grand, my grandmother, she was the purest soul ever. Miss Nanny Brewer. Pastor A.J. Brewer's wife. The, the consummate first lady. I never forget one time. <laughs> I, never went, I never forget one time my granddaddy made her mad. And instead of telling him to go to H, she told him to go to S. Her speech betrayed her. <laughs> Adrian, you praying for me, man? You ain't praying. That's, that's the problem. I'm losing it because y'all ain't praying. So, yo, so, so check this out. So check this out. And I'm over done. So Peter denies him. He had a chance to own him. But based upon what Jesus was going through, Peter chose not to associate with him. Uh, betrayal, denial, and abandonment. Because when the soldiers came to arrest him, the Bible says, even though Peter cut off the soldier's ear, he eventually put up his sword and ran. He fought for him to a certain extent. But when it got too hot, and he saw that they had more swords than he had. The same fellow who said, I'll die with you. He left. 
Betrayal wounds you. Denial wounds you. Abandonment wounds you. Turn to Genesis chapter 2 and I'm going to show you all this. And I'm not crazy. Tell somebody beside you, Bishop ain't crazy. <laughs> Shamise, we will be here for another three hours if you don't tell him. <laughs> tell him. It, it, it's, it's, her, it's her fault that she'll... Say it again. Bishop ain't crazy. Say it. Bishop's not crazy. Say it again. <laughs> Bishop ain't crazy. One more time for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Y'all got Genesis chapter 2? Now remember in John chapter 16, did I read this? Did, when he's, did I read John 16? Okay. Are oh, y'all just trying to get me to hurry up? No. When he says, I'm going to send you a helper. Did I read that? I did. Y'all in the Lord's house. I know it's a school. Y'all in the Lord's house. Don't lie in the Lord's house. Mother Jackson, did I? Okay, I, I believe you. So in John 16, he calls the Holy Spirit the what? The who? Say it again. Helper. The helper. Now watch this in Genesis chapter 2 and I'm getting out of here. What time is it, Troy? Okay, we still going to be out before one. Genesis chapter 2. Y'all got it? I ain't got to none of my notes because this is just in me today. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, um, verse 18. And the Lord God said, y'all got it? And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a what? Comparable to him. Stop. God said it's not good for man or male to be alone. I'm going to make him a what? A helper. Where did I hear that before? I heard it in John 16. That I'm going to send you a helper. Well, here's the question. How does the helper in Genesis 2 get here? Huh? How does the helper in Genesis 2 get here? I'm glad you asked. Verse 22, verse 21 says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Don't miss this. God said, you need a helper. You don't even know you need a helper. But I'm going to give you one. But here's how your helper's going to come. I'm going to put you to sleep. And then I'm going to wound you. Y'all missed this. What God did was he performed surgery. Lord have mercy. He performed orthopedic surgery on Adam so that the helper could show up. Y'all missing this. He said the only way your helper is going to come is that I wound you. Y'all missing this. In Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, I'm closing for real. Jesus says to his disciples, and you shall receive what? Power. After that, the Holy Ghost has done what? Done what? Come where? Come where? Okay, separate the words. Come where? Y'all missed it. Y'all ain't following direction. After that, the Holy Ghost has come. Y'all missed it. I'm almost done. Y'all, come on. We got to end. After 
after that, the Holy Ghost has come where? Y'all going too fast. See, here's the problem. No, watch this. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. We don't understand the process. He says something real interesting. And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come what? And y'all missing this. Pay attention to the directions. Up and on. Up, then on. I got to wound you so that the helper that's in you can come up out of you and then come. Paul says it this way. He says, Put on Christ. In other words, you got to put on his nature and put on his character. But the only way I'm going to get you to put it on you is that I got to allow you to be so wounded, God have mercy, that the spirit of God that's in you has to come up out of you and then. Ow! Finish. Watch this. Watch this. this. So for those of you who going through something that you ain't never gone through before, can I tell you that God is doing you just like He did Adam? Before you even went through it, He played spiritual anesthesiologist. Y'all know what anesthesia does? That's only half of what it does. It puts you in a deep sleep. Watch this. But it brings your body, your neurological system down to a level. Watch this. That it can handle the pain of the surgical process. It's not that you ain't in pain. You sleep. (laughs) Y'all missed it. (laughs) Oh, I'm almost done. He says, I'm bringing the me in you, out of you. But the reason you have not lost your mind, Jonathan, God have mercy, is because I have taken you through a process of spiritual anesthesia that you ain't feeling the pain that is equivalent to what you're going through. Because if you were really feeling it, you would have lost your mind. If you were really feeling it, you would have given up. If you would have really feeling it, you would have stayed in your house, closed your curtains, pulled your cover over your head, taken a bottle of Tylenol, wrote a note, tell everybody I'll see y'all on the other side, but not so. I'm sorry, I couldn't get to my notes. I'm done. I really am. Tell somebody beside you and say, your help is coming. (laughs) Some of y'all just prophesied to somebody who's in a season of hurt and pain and heaviness and distress like you can't even believe. Some of y'all just prophesied to somebody who looks like they got it all together but has almost lost everything. Some of y'all just prophesied to somebody and y'all might even live with them and y'all may know them very well, but they are on the brink of losing it had it not been for the grace of God and the mercy of God. Some of y'all are talking to somebody who the devil has tried to convince that he or she has lost their anointing uh, and that God is through with them. You just prophesied to somebody and you told them your help is coming. And the reason your wound is so deep is because God is trying to bring something out of you that is going to take you to a whole another level in your life. Who am I talking to in here who can see now that the reason you're going through what you're going through is because God has something greater. The 
throw your hands up, throw your head back and shout, my help is coming. Oh my, oh my, oh my, say it again. Say, my help is coming. Somebody else say, my help is coming. Matter of fact, change it. Put a swear note in and say, my help ain't coming. My help is already here. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Touch three people. Say, neighbor, your help is already here. The spirit of God on the inside of you is about to come forth. And when he does, everything around you, everything you're connected to everybody who's in your life that God has placed in your life is getting ready to turn in the direction of blessing in the direction of favor in the direction of increase in the direction of blessing somebody shout yeah shout yes I dare you to go touch somebody who looks like they've been going through who looks like they've been having a hard time touch some Somebody that you know been under attack and that the devil's trying to take out and tell them, neighbor, your help is already here. You may be wounded now, but victory is on the other side of your wounds. Be at peace. Don't give up hope. Don't walk away. Don't throw in the towel, but stand on the promises of God. Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout yes. I feel like hollering. I said I wasn't, but God told me to tell you the Holy Ghost that's in you is getting ready to come up on you. And when he does, you'll have power like you never had before. Throw your head back and shout power. Power to forgive. Power to give. Power to keep going. Power. Shout it. Yes. Very quickly. Very quickly, I never saw that my wounds were prerequisite for the release of the Holy Ghost in my life. And it's all in the Bible. Olives got to be crushed before the oil comes out. And I got to admit, y'all, I had been trying to forgive in my flesh. I had been trying to forgive based upon the decision I made. When the Holy Ghost told me, Kevin, you can't forgive the way you're supposed to unless you allow the divine presence of my spirit in you to work on you. Some of you have been holding grudges. And some of you, your pain has been so deep. And in the message, Dennis, I was going to talk about isolation. Some of you have been so hurt that you've chosen to isolate yourself. I want to mess with nobody. You know what God told me? He said, Kevin, some of the people you're isolating yourself from, he said, that's who your assignment is to. He said, and I had to increase your capacity to forgive to see how badly you wanted to hear me say, well done. If you're in either of those categories, I want you to come because the Lord promised me today that there's going to be a release and outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Right now, I ain't talking about talking in tongues. If you talk in tongues, that's fine. But I'm talking to those of you who are 
bold enough to be honest to say, Bishop, there's some stuff I've been trying to let go. It just won't let go of me. I want you to come. No, I've really been trying. I've been struggling for years. I've been struggling for years to let this go. Hmm. I've even told them that I've forgiven them. And really, I thought that I did. But if perchance I get in their presence... That thing that's stronger than my goodwill shows up again. Anytime I see something that reminds me of what happened, it takes me all the way back. Are there others? Would you please come? He promised me there was going to be a release today. Some of you got your deliverance while the teaching was going forth. For all of our visitors, I, you know, I, I can preach a little bit. But as we were building our lives, the Lord told me to tell the people of God, you've been, you've been asking the Holy Spirit, for power to do this and power to do that. And you've been asking me to bless you with this and bless you with that. And he says, you have forgiven in your mind, in your heart, but you did not use your spirit to do it. So in the secrecy of your time, you're having these conversations with yourself about what it was that injured you. And you got wounds that you just keep, you keep picking at them. You keep picking at them. You keep picking at them. When you have idle time, you start saying, if they hadn't done this to me, or if I hadn't done this for them and they hadn't responded, I wouldn't be in the position. I'm talking to some of you who are in your seat right now. Especially in the, in the and for some of us, for some of us in our seat, it's over a small amount of money, less than $100. But right now, you could use that $100 and now you're looking at what's being taken away and you're looking at what's being messed with and what's being threatened to be discontinued or cut off. And your mind is going right back to if I had not given them that, I would be okay now. I'm almost done. There are a couple of people who are in your seat. And y'all know this. I don't normally put people on front street, but there are about three people now who need to be at this altar because you have not released what won't release you. There's, there's one more. Thank you so very kindly. There's one more. Thank you so much. Holy Ghost does not, does not lie to me. Those three were ready. God is exact in moments like this. Those three were ready. There are others who are not ready, who don't want to release. Maybe, I, maybe I'll get to preach next week. He says something real interesting, Troy. Don't miss this, son. He says, whoever you forgive, they're forgiven. Whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. But whoever sins you retain, they're retained. If you forgive them, I'm going to forgive them. Watch this. Here's what you need to hear. If you release them, God said, I'm going to look at it as you forgiving them, but it does not mean that they will not deal with the consequences of what they've done. You have to give up the desire for them to pay for what they did to you. 
He says, but if you retain it. He said, I'm going to retain it, but wait a minute. Everything I said to you about forgiveness, it wasn't about the person who offended you. Everything I said about forgiveness, I said it to you. So if you retain it, you will have to deal with the consequences of not letting it go. He says, I give you the responsibility to forgive, but I don't take away your right not to forgive. Let me say that again and I'm done. I give you the responsibility to forgive. But I don't take away the consequences for you refusing to forgive. If you don't let it go, you're going to be dealing with consequences. And you're so special to me that I had to wound you. And it pleased Isaiah 53, when you get a chance, go home and read it. And it pleased God to bruise him. Because I want to make you more like me. It pleased me when you were betrayed. I could have killed them before they did it. But I let it happen because it pleased me. <laughs> it pleased me that you were denied, that they denied you. It, it pleased me. I could have stopped them from I could I could I could have stopped them from denying you. I could I could have. But matter of fact, I could have let them deny you, and I could have let somebody say, "Oh yeah, well I don't care what it is. You gonna pay just like they paid." He said, "But it pleased me. It pleased me that they abandoned you." Because sometimes you can't get close to me because there's too many people and too much stuff in between you and me. I'm going to pray, but lift your hands and worship. Open hands. Open hands receive. They release and they receive. And you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come up on you. <laughs> up on you. Up on you. Up on you. He's in there. Up on you. Up. On you, up, on you, up, on you. Up on you. <laughs> up on you. Up on you. There's a new level of power available for you. But just as the woman was in the man all the time, the helper has been in you all the time. Oh. Oh. Elder Greer, you've heard me talk about this in our sidebar conversation, son. That the upper room wasn't the first time the Spirit of God was released in that closed room where the 11 were hurting. Ten were in fear and they were hurting because they, they didn't just think, they, they, they knew. They knew that what happened to Jesus was going to happen to them at some point or another. He steps in the room and he breathes on them. He's given those of you at this altar a private Pentecost before he gives you your public one. Just 
Lift your hands and receive it, please. You having your own public in a low place. The upper room was a high place. God said, I'm coming to visit you in your low place. He said, receive it now. Receive it in your closed-in environment. Receive it now when everything looks like it's falling apart. Receive it now even though people have walked away from you. Receive it now even though it looks like I've turned my back on you. Receive it now. I know you lock the doors. I know you lock the doors, but I'll walk through locked doors because you're just that important to me. You're just that special that you can't even mess this up. I'll keep, listen, I'll walk through a locked door. I love you so much that I will not turn away from you. And in the season, and when you least expect it, I'll step up in your space. Moses, you'll be on the backside of the mountain minding your business. And I'll step up in your space. Abraham, you'll be traveling with your family because you lost a loved one and looks like everything's falling apart and I'll step up in your place. David, you'll be in a dark cave in a place called Angela and I'll step up in your place. You don't think that Saul is going to kill you. You wonder why they doing you the way they doing you. You wonder why you're being misunderstood. You wonder why you're being mispaid, repaid evil for good and 